It is not a coincidence that this bird, often consumed at winter holiday feasts, shares its name with the land of the Turks. The turkey is named after Turkey. At first blush, this makes no sense at all, because the turkey, both in its wild and domestic forms, is indigenous to here, the Americas, not to Eurasia. The world beyond the Americas only obtained this bird relatively recently via the Columbian Exchange. But that fact actually explains why the turkey is called the turkey, or the Hindi, or the Indic, or the Peru. There's all just different people trying to identify this delicious new character who had suddenly appeared in their lives, and they were doing it by either comparing it to similar birds they already knew, or by naming it after the places from which or the people from whom they most directly obtained it. And by that standard, I could call this bird the Wopi, because I got footage of her at Wopi Farm here in Kathleen, Georgia. My name's Farmer Mark. Iwopi is a uh, Lakota Sioux word, and it translates into hope. Speaking of indigenous Americans, what did they call the turkey? I mean, if anybody gets to have an authoritative opinion on the subject, it's them, right? This bird was domesticated in the central areas of Mexico, mainly Oaxaca, 2,000 years ago. I asked my delightfully international followers over on TikTok to duet me and to tell me what they call this bird. So this guy, it's called guajolote in, in Mexico, and the word comes from the Nahuatl language, huexolotl, which literally means the old monster. Just looking at it, the name fits, right? Old monster or beast, or sometimes it's translated as great monster, great beast, Wajalote. That's what the Aztecs called it. Or at least, Wajalote is the Spanish colonists' version of the indigenous word that was something more like this. I'm not even going to try to say it. But the Spaniards did come up with their own name for this bird, and that name is naturally still around in Mexico. Hi, I'm Cristi. I'm from Mexico, and we call this a pavo. Pavo. That's a romance word that potentially goes back to ancient Greek. And it literally means peacock. Peacocks, of course, are different species, originally from South Asia. But you can see why the conquistadors were reminded of peacocks when they first laid eyes on a wajalote, especially a male one. These are male northern wild turkeys displaying their impressive tail fans in a behavior known as strutting. Turkeys, peacocks, chickens, quails, grouse, all those fat little bowling ball shaped birds that live down on the ground and don't swim or fly too good are known collectively to scientists as galliforms, and they all have common ancestors going back to the time of the dinosaurs. Like before Pangaea had broken apart and the Americas even became a distinct continent. That's how far back these animals go. So European explorers and colonists were not wrong when they compared the new galliforms they encountered here in the Americas with the ones they were already familiar familiar with from back home. A turkey is like a peacock because they are distantly related. And a similar such comparison probably explains how this bird came to be known in English as a turkey. It reminded the English of another member of the Galliforms order known as a guinea fowl. Guinea fowl are all over Eurasia, but they're generally considered to be native to Africa, hence the name. Guinea is what Europeans called West Africa. And Farmer Mark actually has a couple of guinea fowl running around Wopi Farm, not because he wants to eat them, but because of what they eat. So the guinea fowl are great for uh, parasites and ticks and fleas and all that sort of, all those sort of bugs that uh, cause problems here on a farm. A uh, guinea fowl can eat uh, pounds of ticks in a single day. Pretty neat, but lots of other people totally eat guinea fowl and their tasty little eggs, too. As the culinary historian Andrew F. Smith writes in this excellent 2006 book of his, guinea fowl was popularized in Western Europe shortly before the Columbian Exchange in the 14th and 15th centuries. Prior to that, rich Europeans had eaten a lot of peacock, but peacocks were apparently difficult to raise and purportedly difficult to digest. Guinea fowl were tastier and easier to raise. The Spanish called them pavo 
1502, and they were brought to Western Europe, quote, by Arab or Turkish traders, or perhaps Portuguese explorers of West Africa. We don't know for sure, but we do know that Turkish traders definitely sailed up to Western Europe and to England and sold all kinds of fabulous things from far away, to the point where the English, for example, referred to anything exotic or unusual as being Turkish or Turkey, Turkey in this context being an adjective describing things of or related to the Turks. And if you trot the globe like a 15th century Turkish merchant, then you might consider patronizing the sponsor of this video, Surfshark, whom I'll now briefly thank. Surfshark is a suite of tools that can help you safely navigate the international waters of the internet, whether you travel physically or virtually. At its core, Surfshark is a VPN, virtual private network. You simply hit connect, and now all of your surfing goes through an encrypted Surfshark server somewhere in the world. They got servers all over. And this allows you to get around internet censorship in countries like China. If a site is blocked in one country, you just go through a Surfshark server in another country. This lets you get around geo restrictions on content. Lots of stuff on YouTube or streaming services is only available in certain countries. Just go through a server in that country and you can watch what you want to watch. And Surfshark has tons of other tools for anonymous browsing and evading hackers. Surfshark is unlimited, and for this limited time holiday offer, you can save 84% if you follow my link in the description and use my code Adam Ragusea when you buy. You'll get 84% off plus four months free. My link is in the description. Thank you, Surfshark. So as we were saying, in Tudor England, they referred to all kinds of exotic things as Turkey, because they got all kinds of wonderful things from far away via Turkish merchants. And then right here in the Oxford English Dictionary, we can see the terms turkey cock and turkey hen showing up in the written record in the 16th century. Cock and hen being English words for a male and female gallinaceous bird, respectively. There is scholarly disagreement about how this all shook out, but from what I can read, the dominant expert view seems to be that the term turkey cock originally applied to guinea fowl first, and then it was applied to these birds from the Americas, either because they reminded Europeans of guinea fowl, or because Europeans confused them with guinea fowl, or because many Europeans would have bought their first turkey from a Turkish merchant, because the Turkish merchants always had the hot new from far away. It's probably a mixture of all of the above, right? Andrew Smith, for example, notes that the Swiss scientist Conrad Gessner wrote in 1555 that the turkey and the guinea fowl are identical, which suggests that he had not seen a turkey at the time. I should tell you that there is a totally different explanation as to where the English word turkey comes from as it applies to a bird. An alternate theory that points out that Tuki is a Hebrew word in the Torah that's used to describe peacock. Tuki became turkey. This is an explanation that was offered by the Italian-American linguist Mario Pei in this 1964 book of his, but scholars now widely view this Hebrew link as apocryphal. It's just a coincidence. Indeed, right before he died in the 70s, Pei gave an interview to the science journalist Robert Krolwich where he reversed himself. At the end of his life, Pei concluded that the English called it a turkey, either because they got it from the Turks or because it reminded them of something one would get from the Turks. An excerpt from Kralwich's radio piece about this. They would consider an Indian thing and a Turkish thing as being about the same sort of thing. So if a strange new bird shows up from some faraway country, it was only natural to call it a turkey, because turkey means far away. And speaking of India, guess what the Turks call a turkey? Hi Adam, I'm Sheriff from Turkey. Uh, we call turkey Hindi and Turkish, which related with Sindhistan, which means India. Hindi. The Turks call this an Indian bird, a Hindi. So do the French, by the way. This became the modern French word donned. In Poland, they named the turkey after India, so did the Dutch. Hen from Kalkun is what this means, after the Indian city, Kalkun. The Dutch eventually just started calling the bird a Kalkun, and then they exported that name for the bird all over the world, for example, to their colony in Indonesia. Hi, I'm Fanny, and in Indonesia we call turkey 
So why did all of these people think this bird came from India when it very much did not come from India, it came from Mexico? Well, Smith writes about a number of possibilities in his book. It may have been because Christopher Columbus referred to the Americas as the Indies. He thought it was India at first, and the name stuck, the West Indies. Problem with that theory is that India cock or chicken of India were already terms used in Europe prior to the Columbian exchange, probably used to describe things like guinea fowl. We do know that the Portuguese established guinea fowl and turkeys in their colonies in India. As a result, Smith reckons the Italians associated associated guinea fowl with India, or maybe just because Europeans in general considered anything exotic as being from India. But regardless, the Turks may have gotten their guinea fowl first from the Italians, so the Turks called the guinea fowl a Hindi and later called the turkey a Hindi because it was a lot like a guinea fowl. As you can gather, it's one big murky turkey mess. But those are all of the elements kind of floating around in the stew that may have been influencing each other in one direction or another to give us the poultry nomenclature that we have globally today. Which is not to say that there aren't even more names for this damn bird. The Portuguese call it a Peru. A lot of people think that comes from the name of the South American nation, Peru, which is at least a little closer to where the freaking bird actually originated. But no, Andrew Smith is not alone among scholars in arguing that Peru is simply a Portuguese corruption of the Spanish word pavo, which you'll remember means peacock. Here's one particularly polyglottic viewer of mine on TikTok who gives us not one, not two, but three names for this bird. My name is Syrian and I'm from Jakarta, but my family's from Guangdong. Um, so turkey in old-fashioned Cantonese, which is my mother's tongue, is fok kai. F uh, fok means fire and kai means chicken. So, and in Mandarin, it's called huo ti. Huo means fire and ti means chicken. And I know in Malay, in Malay it's ayam blander. Uh, ayam means chicken and blanda means Dutch or the Netherlands and basically it means Dutch chicken. Now, something much less confusing than the naming of the bird is why it is so globally popular. This to me is very clear. They're just so meaty, especially compared to other birds. If you saw my recent Christmas goose recipe, you might have been shocked as I was at how small the breasts were when I cut them off whole. Compare that to a turkey breast. Now, admittedly, the modern broad-breasted white turkey breed has a freakishly huge breast compared to its ancestors. Today's commercial breed was created in the mid-20th century by crossing the bronze turkey with the white Holland turkey. That's what farmer Mark has, a white Holland. He also has a rare chocolate turkey breed. Uh, it doesn't mean that the, the meat is brown or anything like that. It's, it, on the inside, it's a normal, uh, normal looking bird. None of these heritage breeds are as freakishly meaty as the modern breed, but they're still freakishly meaty compared to other birds. They're big ol' meatballs on legs, and I think that explains why they have spread so far as to be given a hundred different names. Whatever you call it, I hope that you are as grateful for it as I am this season.